Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So thank you very much for coming today here. I'm grateful to be here amongst all of you. And since Janmashtami is coming, I'll speak today on the topic of greater than God's greatness is his sweetness. So I'll talk this in three parts and after each part, we'll have a brief break where if you have any reflections or questions, can feel free to ask and we'll have some questions at the end also. <clears throat> so I'll speak broadly based on 4.9 in the Bhagavad Gita. Janma karma chame divyam evam yoveti tatvataha tektva deham punar janma naiti mame tiso arjuna. So Krishna says that those who understand the tattva, the philosophical truth, about my appearance and activities, they will attain me. So Krishna is telling over here the truth about him, we have to understand. Now understanding this truth has two aspects, God's greatness and his sweetness. So the first part I'll talk about these two attributes, the greatness and sweetness. Then I'll talk about how these two combine to nourish devotion within us. And then we'll talk specially about how Krishna, the conception of Krishna as God does this in a very unique way. So if we consider that whenever we form a relationship with someone of any kind, at one level, if we are going to meet someone or say if we go for a talk somewhere, then we want to know about the person. And one of the first attributes, say, if whether we are forming a relationship with someone, say, if we want to, we want to know their introduction. Okay, who is this person? So, if somebody is someone special, if they are great, that creates some impact on us. So, okay, okay, this person is maybe worth meeting, worth hearing, worth knowing. So, a we all, when we want to form a relationship with anyone, appreciating or at least knowing their significance, their greatness helps. So similarly with God, when we look at the world around us, sooner or later, this question comes up, where did everything come from? Basically, everything has an actual aspect and a potential aspect. Say for example, right now, <clears throat> say you, all of you may have some children. And so children, they are actually something right now. You know, they are maybe a 5, 7, 10. And they are also potentially someone. Say, that means that they have the potential to become someone much better. Say somebody is very good at music, then actually they are good at music, but potentially they can become great at music. So everything that exists in the world has an actual aspect and a potential aspect. And that which is potential has to be actuated by something outside of itself then the potential becomes actual. That means somebody might have musical talent, that potential is there. But from the potential to the actual, there has to be some actuation, actuation and activation outside of itself. That people need some, some inspiration, some mentor, some guide, some model. And then the potential becomes the actual. So now, if we consider existence itself. Everything exists as a combination of potential and actual and for the potential to become actual some other cause is required. Now if we go backward, backward, backward like this there has to be some some existence which is full actuality. That means another example to illustrate this point is Say, if there is a 100-story building, 
the 100th level exists on the 99, the 99 exists on the 98. Like that, now the first level has to exist on something which does not exist on something else. That's the ground. If there, is, if there are 100 levels and that's all there is, there's no ground, then it won't exist, isn't it? So like that, everything is a combination of potential and actual. But when you go down, down the sequence, there has to be something which is pure actuality. That means it does not depend on anything else to be actuated. It is self-sufficient. Now, This is one of the classical arguments for the existence of God. The another simple way of putting it is that there are many causes, but the cause of all causes, that is the supreme. It's so our common atheistic question is, if God created everything, who created God? Have you heard this question? Yes, yes it's a very common question. Now, this question at one level, it appears like an irrefutable question. But another level, it's not an irrefutable question. It is an insensible question. By insensible, it asking who created God, is like asking who made a circle circular. Well, a circle by definition is circular, isn't it? There is no uh, the asking, you know, who made a circle circular? Well, if it is not circular, then it is not a circle. So we need to look at the definition. A, a circle does not need anyone to make it circular. It is a then it is not it is a circle by its definition is circular similarly god by definition is the source of everything if any if god had a source then the source of everything would be god so another way to understand this could be say uh, some novel is there so something like maybe harry potter might be a little old now but suppose now we consider so, so a child who reads Harry Potter and gets captivated oh this character this character this character and after reading the whole set of novel then person comes to know oh, this novel is written by an author who is the author of Harry Potter J.K. Rowling. Rowling okay <laughs> thank you <laughs> so now if somebody is oh author is J.K. Rowling and then they start reading the whole book okay where is J.K. Rowling now, okay, Harry Potter comes, this is his parent, this is his friend, this is his teachers. But where is Harry Potter? Sorry, where is J.K. Rowling? Is J.K. Rowling in the book? No. no. The author created the storyline, the author created the timeline, the author created the characters, the author created the novel, but the author exists outside the novel. Isn't it? So similarly, God created space, God created people, God created time and God exists outside time. This is the definition of God and that's why we need to, when to understand God, we need to begin with the definition, not the depiction. Depiction means somebody comes to a temple and sees a particular image. Somebody goes to a church or a mosque and sees a particular, gets a particular kind of depiction. Say, how can this be God? Well, don't begin with depiction. Begin with definition. The definition of God is the cause of all causes. So when we ask who created God, why is that question insensible? Because that presumes that God is a being who exists in time that there is a sequence of time and in time a comes from b so then like that god exists in time but god doesn't exist in time time exists in god god exists beyond time just like the author exists outside the storyline you can have the genealogy of all the characters in harry potter but even if you go to great great grandfather of Harry Potter, you won't find J.K. Rowling over there. Because the author exists outside the novel. 
So similarly, God exists outside the fabric of space and time. So understanding God means understanding God's greatness. That He is the basis of the existence of everything else. Natadastivina yatsyan maya bhutam characharam yachapi sarva bhutanam bijam tadam arjuna. So Krishna says that nothing can exist without me. Just as without the ground, no buildings can exist. Just as without the author, no character in the novel can exist. <coughs> without something which is pure actuality, there is nothing which can exist in partial potentiality, partial actuality. <coughs> oh, sorry. Can I have that ginger? So when we talk about God, this is his greatness, that he is the, uh, he is the cause of all causes. But greatness alone is not enough to appreciate God. Because when we understand God's greatness, oh, he's so big. But, okay, he's great. Now we might be impressed by someone. Oh, they're so great. But if you want to develop a personal relationship with them, there's something more. And that is God's sweetness. So I'll come to that. But any questions or comments till now? Only that it's beautiful. How you've explained it is just amazing. Because it just means that you've just given me so many ideas to talk about this with so many people. Because yes, these are questions that are put to you so many times and you're not you're at a loss and you know you're not so intelligent to put it as nicely as you put it it's just beautiful thank you happy to be your service yeah sometimes people who are atheistic you know they uh, they have a some not everyone but they have a intellectual arrogance to them they think that you know we are far superior to intellectually that's why we need adequately sophisticated explanations of our beliefs. So I'm happy to provide something like that. Thank you. Yes. Um, you mentioned the actuality and then the, the potential, right? Yeah. Um, and you mentioned that, uh, so you have a state of actuality and then uh, you want to reach, uh, you have a high potential and you need something from outside which gives you a, a, a stimulus. Push, stimulus. Yeah. But why does that stimulus have to come from outside? Why can't it come from within? Yeah, of course. When I said that the that the potential has to come from outside, it's not a black and white. Generally speaking, growth can we can envision it in two ways. Say, for example, if uh, there is a seed which grows into a tree, now the seed has to have some potentiality within itself. But if there's, instead of a seed, there is a stone, then no matter how much you water it, no matter how much you nourish it, how many fertilizers you put, it's not going to grow. Hmm? So there has seed has to have innate potentiality. But for that potential to become actual, there has to be something from outside. That is sunlight or water or fertilizer or whatever. So similarly for us, at the very least, so even if somebody is say a prodigy, somebody is like a child genius, now they may grow up and they may become legendary musicians or legendary performers of some field, whatever. But then they, they need something outside. What would they need? At the very least, they need a forum where they can express it, isn't it? So uh, we don't necessarily mean that everything is external, nor is everything internal. 
the whole idea of dynamism means that there is the there is the inner source of the dynamism but there is also an outer stimulus for the dynamism if somebody is a brilliant musician but nobody knows about them you could say still they're great musician but then their potential is not actualized till now it's not fully manifest so it's a combination of the inner and the outer uh, that is that is the way for the potential to become actual does that make sense to you there's something else on your mind so yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> that means that you would have an inner if if you have if the seed has enough uh, to grow without any outer intervention uh, then it could grow potentially uh, without an outer stimulus similarly if you were to reach a state of uh, uh, potent uh, your <coughs> potential then that would also imply that you could have an inner stimulus as well yeah but at the very least you could say time is needed if nothing else time is a stimulus isn't it so you could say a newborn baby has the potential to grow grow up into a fully grown human being yes but time is needed so the point i'm making is that uh, we all are dependent on something outside of ourselves prabhupad would say god never becomes god god is always god that means god is not dependent on time for his godhood to manifest that may happen in his uh, manifested past times in this world and i'll talk about that in the sweetness part but the point is that from a philosophical perspective that all of us if even if we don't need anything else and nowadays there's the age of rugged individualism you know i alone will fight against the big bad world and prove my greatness even if somebody is like that actually nobody is entirely like that everybody needs helpers of course some people might get more help some people might get less help some people have a far greater opposition than others but still everybody needs lucky breaks and usually they come from something outside of ourselves so let's say there is the actuality and there is the potentiality and for the potentiality to become actuality the potentiality has to be there but some stimulus at least the passage of time has to be there that makes sense okay thank you so now i i talked about the greatness of god what is the second aspect sweetness. sweetness of god so now actually speaking it is you could say greatness that brings submission somebody so great oh i to submit to them if we understand that somebody is far wiser far more learned than what we are then oh okay let me listen to what they say so greatness brings submission but along with that it is sweetness that brings affection no okay somebody is very great we might be impressed by that we might submit to that say if you are a brilliant professor in college and we are impressed by them and if they make a they make a particular statement we accept it we submit to it but then that might not really form a really really form a personal relationship with them maybe when we come to know about their personal life maybe how they deal with people how they are at a one to one level then it's it is the sweetness that brings affection and so in the bhakti tradition now the conception of god is there in all the theistic traditions in the world but the bhakti tradition goes especially ahead in highlighting the sweetness of god and how is the sweetness highlighted actually it is affection is as affection is a skindel by sweetness but sweetness essentially means to some extent some admission or recognition of vulnerability so imagine now if you have a child and now if i say okay my child okay you know actually is maybe has this weakness maybe is physically a little sick maybe if if 
suppose we could have the power to refashion our child according to our dreams. Hmm? <laughs> suppose we had that power. Okay. Sorry? How scary is that? <laughs> yeah, so, okay. He's a little physically weak. I'll make him physically like a superman. Or maybe what now? I don't want to be. Maybe too gender neutral, maybe Wonder Woman or whatever. <laughs> okay. But then, okay, and I want to be not just physically strong, I want to be brilliant. Okay, then you make them something like Albert Einstein. Now, if you redesign them in a way that is every way, they're completely perfect. Uh, they become like a superhuman, genetically engineered, so maybe superhuman being you will find that actually a large part of the sweetness in a relationship comes by feeling needed in the relationship. You know, if the child would be completely perfect, the child doesn't need you. <laughs> Isn't it? And it's normally, when I said vulnerability, a particular, see, all of us in our day-to-day -day lives, we put on a facade of strength and not necessarily facade in a negative sense but the world is a cruel place and people can exploit us if they sense some weakness in us so that's why we put on an appearance of strength and especially when two people are they want to come close to each other one very vital way of come that thing that brings people close to each other is the admission of vulnerability. That means, oh, I'm not, I'm not sure about this. I, I, maybe I can't do this. Then when we see that vulnerability in someone, then we feel, oh, this person is great, but maybe I can do something for them. I am needed here. And that creates a special bonding, which is otherwise not. So, here I am talking about the concept of sweetness. So, sweetness comes in a relationship when we, we sense some vulnerability and not that we want to exploit that vulnerability, but that vulnerability creates a sense of need. Even my presence in this relationship counts. I can do something. And then that brings a particular flavor, a sweetness to that relationship. And this same principle applies to God. Although God is supreme and invulnerable, although God, Om Purna Madha Purna Midam, although God is complete, but still, God, in order to manifest His sweetness, subordinates His Godhood. God as Krishna in Vrindavan does not always manifest his omnipotence. He acts not as the supreme king presiding on a majestic throne, but as a simple, sweet, small coward boy. And Mother Ishuda feels, if I don't feed him, he will go hungry. He will become weak, he will become sick, he will die. And that is, is it an illusion? Is this an illusion? What do you think? Is it an illusion? Yes, it is an illusion, but our tradition has a special word for it. Yoga Maya. Now, the word yoga maya, if you think of it philosophically, it is very peculiar. Maya is illusion, that which takes us away from God. Yoga, it is not just physical exercises, although that's what people, many people think of. Yoga is what? Connecting with Connection, connecting with God. So, if maya is that which disconnects us from God. Yoga is that which connects us with God. So, what are these two words doing together? Is it it? Yoga Maya. What is this idea? It's so, us to the God while, like, in a, in a, it's like an illusion. Yes. Us to the Lord. That's yes. Us to the Lord. Perfect. 
Yoga Maya is the illusion that intensifies connection. So in a sense, this is an oxymoron. Does anyone know what is an oxymoron? Oxymoron is, yes, what is it? Yes, yeah, two words with opposite meanings brought together. Say for example, if you tell somebody, oh, that's brilliantly stupid. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> Either it's brilliant or it's stupid. <laughs> so, when you have two opposite words, then if you say that is spectacularly ugly. <laughs> what? <laughs> So it's like uh, so suicide is said to be an act of courageous cowardice. It requires courage to actually uh, end your life. It's not easy. Many times somebody might decide I, I want to commit suicide and they go and lie down on a rail track and then they hear the sound of the rail coming. And the sound comes, the whistle comes, and they think, maybe another time. <laughs> <laughs> and they get up and go away. So it requires courage. However, because if somebody is ending their life because they feel my problems are so many and I can't deal with them, they don't have, then in a sense, it's cowardice. So it's courage because one is ending one's life, but it's cowardice because the cause is not glorious. Like somebody who is a patriot or somebody who is a firefighter or somebody who is a coast guard, they risk their lives to save someone. Then that is courageous. That cause is glorious. But in this case, the cause is inglorious or just inability to face life's problems. So the point is that <clears throat> yoga maya is an oxymoron. And that means that this is the illusion that fosters connection. And what is the illusion? The illusion is that the supreme invulnerable appears vulnerable. The supremely independent appears dependent. The supremely complete appears incomplete. And that is what intensifies the affection. So, in Vrindavan, every devotee feels that they can do something for Krishna. This Krishna is so wonderful, but still I can do something for him. So when Krishna is playing with the cowherd friends, every day when they take their food, they, the mothers pack their lunches and they take them and go out into the forest. Atatiyad Bhavan in the Gopi Gita, the Gopis are contemplating that every morning when we see you going out to the forest, we start feeling as if one moment of separation from you is like one millennium. But when they go out, Krishna goes out, at one level he's God, he's perfect. But he he works. It's his profession. He is a coward boy. So, Charayan Pashun. He goes out to graze the cows. And when he goes out in this way, at that time, <clears throat> the gopas go with them, they, with him, and they take various, their particular lunches. And then, they, when they are all sharing lunch, they all say, Krishna, please take this. Krishna, please take this. They feel we can offer something to Krishna. That, actually, this food is so nice. I want to offer this to Krishna. Now, if we consider Krishna to be complete and perfect, then nobody can do anything for him. He doesn't need anything. So, the sweetness of Vrindavan is that the one who doesn't need anything he creates an illusion by which it appears as if he needs something. And that's how the sweetness comes up. Now the sweetness is, we can hear sweet pastimes of Krishna and especially Krishna's Bal Leela is very beautiful and very sweet. 
and that's wonderful to hear but when we understand what lies at the foundation of the sweetness that the omnipotent god appears deficient in some way then now this deficiency is not a defect in him why because he can transcend the deficiency whenever he wants so let's consider for example the brahma vimohan leela at one moment krishna is with the gopas <clears throat> and they are all grazing they they are all chatting and eating food while the cows are grazing and then brahma ji through green grass lures the cows away cow and then when they go away they all the gopas become concerned oh become concerned oh where where are the cows gone and krishna says all of you you eat i'll go and find them now when krishna says i'll go and find them and he walks away so at that time it appears as if he is not omniscient it appears as if he doesn't know where the cows are and that's why he's gone for gone searching for them and he searches far and wide but they disappeared without a trace and he is puzzled and he thinks maybe i went so far away that maybe they'll come back from some other path and he comes back and what happens what what happens the, the cows the go gowherd boys also gone go for say what happened it's you know for all of us there is change in our life but there has to be something that is unchanging if everything is changing then you know, the bigger the magnitude of the change the greater is the uncertainty so he goes over there the cows have disappeared he comes back the cow and boys have disappeared what's happening so he appears to be bewildered but then the next moment oh this is brahma's trick oh brahma is creating an illusion like this now krishna is so expert that what krishna does is that brahma creates an illusion but krishna creates an illusion within that illusion what does that mean oh, the cowherds cows and cowherds uh, disappeared oh, then krishna expands so there is the reality that they are in vrindavan there is the illusion that they have been taken away another illusion that they are all still there but what krishna does is he creates an illusion within an illusion but this illusion takes a brahma to the supreme reality in <laughs> <laughs> what happens brahma comes back and he says hey what's going on here i thought everybody had disappeared and everybody is there hey he just can't make sense of anything sometimes you know we we speak something to disturb someone and then if they are not disturbed we become disturbed <laughs> why are you not disturbed isn't it <laughs> Say somebody is a very powerful person, and they punch someone, and nothing happens to that person. Hey, what happened? You know, has my punch lost power? So, so like that, when Brahma Ji creates the disturbance, and there's no disturbance, he becomes disturbed. What's going on? And he goes and sees how oh, these gopas he had taken the cows and the coward boys and hidden them in a cave in a mystic slumber. and they're still there and they're here also he goes back and comes back and goes back and comes back he just can't make sense of things and then that is when as he's going more and more into illusion then brahma ji ji seeing that he's becoming so bewildered so there is reality there is illusion there's a illusion within an illusion but then krishna reveals the reality and krishna reveals <clears throat> that actually he is it is he who has expanded as all the gopas and the cows but he doesn't show it that he so he doesn't show that all of them are krishna he shows all of them are who themselves individual yeah but vishnu vishnus 
specifically he shows if you see this picture of brahma vimohan leela it's krishna and there are all vishnus around him why vishnus because <coughs> brahma ji knows that vishnu is great you know he goes and he seeks help from vishnu whenever there is a trouble which he can't solve so if we consider the hierarchy the cosmic hierarchy or the trans cosmic hierarchy you could say this is the earthly level this is the celestial level where the gods live and among the celestial the topmost is brahma's level and above brahma's level is vishnu's level so now brahma knows vishnu is above him so there is a terrestrial celestial and transcendental so now he knows vishnu is above him but krishna is on the celestial terrestrial or the earthly level and therefore he thinks is this krishna really god and it is krishna's sweetness his vulnerability that has bewildered so how brahma ji decides to figure check is this really god aghasur has been killed and it creates a big news how how did aghasur get killed like this who killed him <coughs> in the abrahamic religion there is this the story of david and the goliath a small child kills a big giant and in fact you know every christian leela is like a david and goliath story isn't it krishna is so small and his demons are so big so what power did david have like the brahma you want to know what power did krishna have and then when he comes in sees at that time what does he see that krishna and the <clears throat> krishna and the cowherd boys are eating food and then it is not only that they are eating food but the cowherd sometimes they take some food and then they eat a little food and then they give it to someone else they give and then they give it to krishna also and now this is uh, sacrilegious how can you give the food that has touched your mouth to to god he just can't i just krishna just can't uh, brahma ji says this can't digest it you know sometimes there are certain things which are the, the gravity of them in the cultural context you understand it you know, i was traveling once with um, some western devotees not western devotees western yogi western westernized yogis uh, or westernized people and then we are going for a program and now i have my bottle of water with me and usually when i drink it i just touch my mouth it doesn't spill out so one of them said i'm very uh, uh, i'm very thirsty so can you give me some water i said actually you know i touch my mouth i can't give this now because they they you know there some people are completely new and in, in english there is not even a proper word for jhoota <laughs> <laughs> you can say remnants but it doesn't convey that meaning <laughs> so he says you know in our tradition if you touch the mouth to water you cannot give he says but i'm thirsty he says no i'm sorry he says you mean if i'm dying of thirst till you not give me water <laughs> so it becomes very difficult if uh, the culture the cultural context is not there but the idea of giving something which is your jhoota you cannot do that and especially to god how can you do that so brahma ji when he sees this manifestation he is bewildered i started thinking is this really god so again what i started by talking about you know look at the definition not at the depiction or look at the definition first then at the depiction but what brahma ji does is he sees the depiction what is going on over here this can't be god so the sweetness bewilders him so what krishna does is when he manifests he manifests the vishnu forms and that he knows vishnu is above me and then we see is actually all these vishnus are coming from krishna and then he understands oh this krishna must be someone very special this krishna must be great And, but it's very interesting that if we look at Brahma ji's prayers, the tenth canto of the Shrimad Bhagavatam, the thirteen chapter is the bewilderment of Brahma, and the fourteen chapter is Brahma ji's prayers. 
and those prayers initially start with oh how i mistook you to be an ordinary ordinary person but you are the supreme person so it's initially appreciating krishna's greatness but he does not stop with krishna's greatness then as he starts offering prayers the subsequent prayers are appreciating krishna's sweetness in vrindavan and he says how fortunate ahonandan amna mahabhagyam what is the fortune of nanda what is the fortune of yashoda what is the fortune of these cows that you drink their milk what is the fortune of these coward boys that they offer the food that they have eaten to you and you take it so he starts appreciating the sweetness of vrindavan and that is the line so at the end of it he prays o oh krishna all these rajwasis are so great now i i want their blessings i want that they put their feet on my head and thus he aspires and eventually krishna rewards him so that he becomes a hill in vrindavan <clears throat> the hill on which krishna lives and the maharaj's house that is considered to be by manifestation of brahma ji so basically he appreciates krishna's sweetness so the sweetness of krishna and vrindavan is not simply that he is vulnerable it is that the supreme invulnerable appears vulnerable and dramatically whenever he wants he casts aside his vulnerability and manifests in vulnerability whenever he wants he is omniscient and he appears ignorant and then suddenly he becomes omniscient so this dynamism adds to the sweetness and if we analyze brindavan pastimes this way as krishna is sometimes all powerful sometimes krishna is apparently powerless and then again he becomes all powerful so when krishna is a small child small baby he is so light that dreamant trunavart comes and effortlessly takes him high into the sky and then suddenly he becomes so heavy <coughs> that trunavart crashes down so this dynamism of how krishna uses both his sweetness and his greatness to flavor his pastimes that makes vraj leela spectacular so there is god's greatness but there is his sweetness and the sweetness helps us to appreciate god better and even his greatness better so in the brahma vimohan leela we see that he encounters krishna's greatness oh he killed a ghasur but then he is impressed by that but he encounters krishna's sweetness and is bewildered by that hey, how is he eating somebody's jhuta and then he encounters krishna's greatness oh krishna has manifested as all these gopas as vishnu they are expanded from him and then he appreciates krishna's sweetness oh that lord who is the source of vishnu that lord is now here with us uh, is here among the brajwasis as a simple coward boy how great is that lord how wonderful is that lord how sweet is that lord so thus his devotion flows in waves completely <coughs> inundating his heart and making him utterly absorbed in krishna so sahaj is krishna's sweetness so any questions or comments about this yes please on what is vulnerability because where, okay that love appears mm-hmm. the love appears that because they don't think he's god they appear to just appreciate mm-hmm. his wonderful nature mm-hmm. as opposed to his greatness uh, it's not necessarily one or zero is it that the Prajvas is appreciate Krishna only because of his vulnerability. Um, because, but I say, so is it 
estamos hablando de Lisa. He's talking about all anger police. You can cover that this answer at the same time because they're not they're, they're not they're not in all reference. Okay. Mm. Yeah, just. <coughs> so do the Vrajavasis appreciate Krishna uh, only for his uh, vulnerability so we have in the Damodar Leela uh, there is the mention of the arm and reverence but then it's all sweetness after that mm. this, there is um, a priority priority means that for the Vrajavasis they love Krishna because he is Krishna, not because he is God. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that they don't, they don't know he is God or they don't care that he is God. Oh, that he is, it's like we love Krishna and he is also God. Oh, that's so wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so, Krishna's being God is like additional which flavors their love for him. So it's like even the daytime, the stars are there in the sky. But because the sun is so bright, we don't see the stars at that time. So similarly for them, Krishna's sweetness is so great that they're not even aware of Krishna's greatness. But that doesn't mean they're ignorant. It is that it's in the background and when needed, they will also manifest awareness of that. That's why the same Rajivasis who at one level uh, want to do things for Krishna, feel that Krishna will be deficient if I don't do this for them, for him. The same Rajivasis, when they are in trouble, they also pray to Krishna for protection. Hmm? The same Rajivasis that they actually ask Krishna, please protect us. When Indra is showering down rains, when they ask Krishna like this, they implicitly have that faith that Krishna has the potency to protect us. So as I said, it's, it's that unpredictable combination of uh, omnipotency and lack of omnipotency that flavors Krishna's pastimes. But in terms of priority, you're right. The Vrajivasis, they love Krishna because he is Krishna, not because he is God. And that he is God is additionally sweet for them. Okay. Thank you. So I was say about now with respect to Damodar Leela, it's about this. Uh, we do see that um, God is bound over there. Hmm? And that's his vulnerability. How can he be bound? But then, while he is bound, what is happening? While he is bound, he is liberating those who are bound. He, rather than needing someone to unbind him, <coughs> he is unbinding someone else. So he is, while he is vulnerable, still he is also omnipotent. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Hare Krishna. So any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. So, how can Brahmaji, who has composed Brahma Samhita, forget Krishna's greatness or sweetness? And if it happens to Brahma, how can we protect ourselves? Or can we protect ourselves? There are two distinct things over here. First is, when we look at great characters like Brahmaji, we have to understand that they are not like ordinary characters. 
they're all they're not ordinary characters their illusion is not like our illusion so let's take indra in the bhakti literature sometimes indra almost appears like a cartoon character and he keeps making such stupid mistakes and you start thinking is indra indra is the king of gods you have to understand that actually <coughs> indra is a very powerful and venerable person and especially if you read the vedic literature and there indra is glorified so much because in the path of karma kanda indra is a summit of achievement and it's important to know his position but the bhakti literature have a particular purpose and that purpose is to demonstrate the paramount see the supremacy of bhakti and to demonstrate the supremacy of bhakti the contrast is drawn with someone who is very great but as compared to bhakti he is insignificant hmm? so say for example if uh, somebody wanted to learn, say in cricket somebody wants to learn spin bowling hmm? and then say there's a leg spinner who bowls and then you have these videos of this leg spinner you know just clean bowling outwitting foxing uh, and uh, getting this bats batsman out now when you want to show a leg spinner uh, bowling out you will not just show him bowling out some ordinary street batsman then you will show that leg spinner a clean bowling maybe a champion batsman now if you are reading that book or watching this video on leg spin bowling and then you see this champion batsman you may think this batsman does nothing except get out <laughs> but now if you want to know about the batsman you have to read you have to watch another video where the batsman is batting very well that batsman is not a champion just so that this leg spinner can get him out the batsman is a champion is on the right but while you are talking about leg spin bowling you will show how this champion batsman gets out maybe 50 times so like that indra and brahma they are all great people but to demonstrate the potency of bhakti it is shown as if they get outwitted and now of course you could say that there is a reason why brahma maybe brahma was over confident of his knowledge and that's how he got deluded that's also a possibility so these past times can be seen from different perspectives for us to learn something we can say okay then this is what brahma ji did this is what i should not do but while drawing lessons like this we shouldn't judge those characters as <coughs> as wrong <coughs> because they are a part of the lord's past time and just to be a part of that past time they they are exalted hmm? so that's that's the part about brahma ji how does he get bewildered <coughs> it it's it's a part of krishna's plan so that the glory of rajwasi is the glory of krishna and vrindavan is manifested in an extremely attractive way hmm? and as far as we getting bewildered yes that is not only possible but it's probable in the world because this world is a place of temptation and illusion and that's why i write every day an article on the bhagavad gita as i mentioned in the introduction so i'm just in the process of writing an article it's, uh, it's called the essence of commitment is recommitment the essence of commitment is recommitment you know we commit ourselves to something and the nature of this world is we'll get diverted from it and when we say somebody is committed it doesn't mean it's we as conscious beings have free will so that commitment is not like it's like a mechanical glue you know you fix something to the wall and it stays fixed forever we as conscious beings can't be like that you know i become fixed in krishna bhakti and i'll stay fixed forever no because we are conscious beings there will be temptations in the world and those temptations distractions will divert us but the essence of commitment the key to commitment is recommitment we'll go off come back go off come back yato yato nischalati manaschanchalam asthiram ततस्तो नियम ये तद आत्मशम नए वेर एवर एंड वेन एवर द माइंड वॉन्डर्स 
Krishna says, bring it back under the control of the self. So it will wander. Krishna is not saying that it, uh, Krishna is not asking or expecting from us that the, your mind will not wander. He says, the mind will wander, but get it back. It will wander, get it back. So then, uh, a, so we will forget. We can't avoid that. Because the world is a place where there are so many ways in which we might call, we might be uh, we might be allured into forgetfulness. But if we expect that and prepare for that, and one preparation is you know, having practices, having situations or settings, surroundings that reorient us back that's why you know, we regularly come to the temple that's why we regularly associate with devotees that's why we regularly have a program of sadhana so we get diverted we come back we get diverted we come back and by this diversion and reversion diversion and reversion what will happen gradually is that the diversion will become lesser and lesser Krishna will enter more and more into our consciousness and the diversions will be there but they will be less, 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 less. So it's like sine waves go up and up and down, up and down but gradually the amplitude of the sine wave will decrease and thus we will become steadier and steadier in our devotion. Okay? Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so say in today's modern world, how can we practically practice Krishna Bhakti and go towards loving Krishna? Just as whether it's modern times or ancient times, we still need the sun for illumination. We might have street lights and home lights that might that might not that might make us feel that we don't need the sun so much. But still we need the sun. So like that there are certain principles which remain unchanging. Hmm? No matter whether we are in modern, pre-modern or post-modern times, whatever. Hmm? And that principle is that devotion, the devotion is conscious, continuous cultivation. Devotion is not just emotion. If we think of devotion as emotion, then oh, the kind of emotion that say, great saintly, great saints had, I don't have any of it at all. Yeah, that's true. We may not have it. But devotion uh, is not just that emotion. There can be some emotional effervescence which great saints manifest. But just that emotional ecstasy doesn't, doesn't uh, solely define their sainthood. Their sainthood is because of their dedication. It is their consistency. So we might not have those emotional highs, but devotion is conscious, continuous cultivation. So at our level, we can say, how can I cultivate my heart? So just like, as you said, coming to, the, coming to programs like this, that's a cultivation. And uh, we try to make our friends as much as possible devotees so basically there's a principle of for this conscious continuous cultivation we talk about a b c d a is association just come in like-minded spiritually minded people b is reading books that gives us uh, a intellectual philosophical orientation for our spiritual journey c is chanting of mantras especially spiritual sound vibration 
uh, that can spiritualize our consciousness and D is deity and diet you know, we worship Krishna in the form of the deity we offer him our bhog, the food that we take we offer it to him and then we take it so if we do these things then we all can be nourished in our devotion okay. thank you any other questions okay so I'll conclude with the last point so I talked about Krishna's greatness then I talked about Krishna's sweetness and now for all of us when we are practicing bhakti there are times I said greatness in their greatness what does it do it inspires submission and sweetness inspires affection and we need a deep devotion or genuine devotion is a combination of submission and affection so for all of us in our spiritual journey we need an awareness of both so sometimes we need reminders of Krishna's greatness see we are going through our lives there are daily struggles and sometimes things happen completely opposite to the way we want them to and I, you know, why is this happening like this sometimes we are, we are even praying to Krishna and nothing seems to be happening so at such times when everything seems to be falling apart you know, humility means to know that we don't have access to Krishna's plan that Krishna's intelligence is far bigger than our intelligence so sometimes when we are bewildered not knowing what is happening we need to remind ourselves of Krishna's greatness that sometimes you know, when we go and pray to, pray to Krishna also Krishna please help me at that time what do we mean by Krishna please help me what it means is Krishna I have this problem and I know the solution to this problem also you know this person is troubling me so much the solution is this person should stop behaving like this so the, I, we are forming a relationship with Krishna but the terms of the relationship are my intelligence and your power I know the solution <laughs> I know the solution you just you just make the solution happen <laughs> so we are trusting Krishna but we are actually half trusting Krishna that means we are trusting Krishna's power but not his intelligence <laughs> yeah Krishna you know you can do this but probably this thought didn't come in your mind <laughs> so I am giving you this thought now you please do this <laughs> So of course we can uh, we can pray to Krishna and if we, we feel that things should be in the particular way we can pray to Krishna you know I, have, I want to serve you and if it, things work out like this I can serve you better we can pray we can express our use our intelligence and express our desire certainly we have our individuality but if things are not working the way we want them to and if Krishna is also not responding to our prayers or at least it seems like that then we need to be aware of Krishna's greatness that Krishna's plan can be far bigger than our conception also so then Krishna's that awareness of Krishna's greatness can also bring submission okay I'm in the situation and let me just do my best in the situation although it's a difficult situation but there is a purpose for this what is the purpose I do not know but Krishna is in charge Krishna will guide me so that awareness of Krishna's greatness can help us accept situations when they don't make sense accept situations which are very difficult for us but at that time we may also there are times when we also need <coughs> Krishna's sweetness that means that oh I have this problem in my life, that problem in my life, that problem in my life. And sometimes we may have this question, you know, when we come to Krishna, should we just you know, strive to solve the problem and then devote ourselves to Krishna? Or should we just forget the problem and just devote ourselves to Krishna? Now it's not this or this, it can be both. So sometimes when we have a problem, at that time, just what 
put everything aside absorb yourself in krishna get an experience of krishna's sweetness you know come to the temple and maybe look at the lord's beautiful darshan participate in some kirtan hear some katha just forget everything else and experience the sweetness of krishna yes this is a big problem this is terrible this is troublesome but krishna's sweetness is still there krishna is still there in my heart remembering krishna can still fill me with sweet fill me with such sublime emotions and that can pacify our minds that can soothe our hearts and then when we experience krishna's sweetness that can rejuvenate us yes i all these issues are there i have to deal with them but by experiencing krishna's sweetness we get strength to deal with them again so when we are practicing bhakti of both of these when we are practicing bhakti in this world where there are so many troubles for us an awareness of krishna's greatness that his ways are different from ours his plan is not just different but it is better than our plan so let me just wait but while waiting life is unbearable then let me just absorb myself in krishna don't let the problem dominate my consciousness so much that i can't think of krishna just put the problem aside absorb yourself in krishna and then you'll find that you'll get strength so when we connect with krishna we may have to live with pain but we won't have to live in pain with pain because yes the difficulty is still there but in pain means that we are consumed by that we can't think about anything else when we connect with krishna our consciousness expands yes this problem is there but krishna is bigger don't tell god how big your problems are tell your problems how big god is and then what will happen is we live to move forward in our life yes the problems will be there but we will recognize if we practice bhakti that the world can hurt us in many ways but greater than the world's power to hurt is krishna's power to heal greater than the world's power to hurt is krishna's power to heal so rather than looking at the world we look beyond the world to krishna we turn toward krishna and we will be healed no matter how much the world hurts us so this understanding of krishna's greatness and sweetness can empower us to withstand the world's hurts and to open ourselves to krishna's healing and thus we can march forward in our life so i'll summarize i spoke today on this topic of greater than krishna's greatness is his sweetness so first i talked about the conception of god is not just an image to be depicted depicted in the some some temple we talked about god is that being who is pure actuality all of us are a combination of potential and actual and we need something outside ourselves to transform the potential to the actual it's like a multi story building it has to have the ground so there has to be one being which is pure actuality which is not caused by anything else which is the cause of all causes so to ask who created god is like asking who made a circle circular hmm? is like by definition god is the cause of all causes god does not exist in time time exists in him to ask who created god means to think that god is a being in time is like asking where is the author in a novel? where is jk rowling in the harry potter novel god exists outside the fabric of time and space so this is god's greatness then i talked about god's sweetness all the god is pure actuality full actuality but in his past times in vrindavan he manifests vulnerability so we i talked about how sweetness comes in a relationship first we want to know the greatness with someone so that we want to form a relationship with them but then when you want to go deeper into that relationship we if we see the vulnerability then we feel needed then if if we could redesign our child so that the child was completely perfect and the child wouldn't need us at all and then where would be the parent child relationship at all then so 
God, although he is completely perfect, he manifests vulnerability. Mother Ishoda to her it feels that oh without me Krishna will starve and die and this this is an illusion but it is a divine illusion yoga maya it's an oxymoron so God manifests manifests illusion so that there can be greater devotion and then we talk elaborately about the Brahma Vimohan Leela how the sweetness caused illusion but then the greatness was manifested and the illusion went away. And then there was appreciation of the sweetness of the Lord also. So Brahma created an illusion, Krishna created an illusion within that illusion, but through that he took him to the ultimate reality. Uh, so we all um, can appreciate the sweetness of Krishna's pastimes when we see how there is an unpredictable combination of invulnerability and vulnerability that manifests in those pastimes. And in conclusion, I talked about how we in our day-to-day -day lives, in our practice of bhakti, when we are bewildered or overwhelmed by life's difficulties, we can appreciate God's greatness. He's so great, He's so wise, that His plan, I can't know. But let me just keep moving on, accept the situation and move on. So, awareness of Krishna's greatness can bring a submission and acceptance of life's difficulties. And a reminder or absorption in Krishna's sweetness. So, I have these problems, how do I deal with them? Just absorb yourself in Krishna and that sweetness can give us strength, rejuvenation and then we can be healed to again face life's problems. So, we may have to live with pain but we don't have to live in pain. If we expand our consciousness and absorb it in Krishna, greater than the world's power to hurt is Krishna's power to heal. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare. 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 Hare.